Okay, we're back today and we're going to continue learning about functions. So, I may not have mentioned uh, in the last class about functions, something that I wanted to make specific. So far, when we've been writing Python code, if we start writing code like this, uh, and so on and so forth as we go down. One thing has been implicit that really hasn't been mentioned at all, and that is that code is executed from top down. So in other words, the code execution starts at line one and goes down from there. Every subsequent line that's lower is executed after the one above. So if that's true, then um, why, when we create a function like so, if we go def and we call, uh, for some reason or other, computer scientists always like to use the function name foo, F-O-O. -O. Um, so you'll find that in many textbooks and whatnot. So if we make a function like this, and we don't pass any arguments to it. There's nothing inside the brackets here. And we could simply go just a print statement. When we run this program, the code inside this function is not executed unless we call the function. So in other words, Execution still starts at line number one, and it goes down. So when the when you this is I'm talking about when you're actually running the program, it goes top down again. It gets to this line, and it says, "Aha! Okay, I'm about to be given the definition of a function, and the name of it is called foo. So I'm going to memorize this now." And then it goes on into the function, and we might have other, there might be many lines inside the function, but as long as they're tabbed, they're in the function. And as soon as you start stop tabbing, as in line seven, the, the function re recognizes, Python recognizes that the function's finished. Now, interestingly, it doesn't actually run this code. So if I was to run this right now, let's uh, just save it here. Uh, as a, a test again. Test one. Okay. And we'll, over, we'll replace it. Okay, so notice the output of this. There's no output at all. So what I want to make clear is these print statements are not being executed. But they are being memorized. So Python memorizes that block of code as belonging to the function foo. That's the purpose of, of putting this code here. It's not so that it just automatically gets executed, like these lines below. It's in order to have Python memorize that block of code and associate a name with it. And in this case, the name is foo. So if I want to execute the that code, I actually have to call it in the main part of the program. So lines right now, lines seven to nine is the main part of the program. This is from three to, to five is the function. This doesn't get executed unless you call it. So what? So in other words, this is simply the function definition. Okay, I want you to make note of that vocabulary that I'm using. That's the function definition. And here we're going to call the function. And the, the way we call it is we say, we just call the name of the function. We type in the name, and then we put the brackets. And when I do this, and I run this, now we see hi by. And interestingly, I can call this again. And if I run this, it does it twice. Now. Alternatively, I could, for example, put this function call 
in a for loop and it'll be called four times. So there is some real benefit that so in other words, let's say you wanted to have it multi let's say you wanted it, you know, here and you wanted your function to go here. And in this case it doesn't really make sense to do this. But I'm what I'm trying to convey here is that if you have to execute this distinct code in the function that has a specific purpose, you don't want to keep you don't want to keep copy pasting this code everywhere in, in your program. I'm trying to explain to you the justification for a function's existence. In other words, if I wanted to, to execute the code in that function at this location, and then you know inside the function here, and then let's say after that function, or and let's say multiple other places. Let's say it's something really useful that I, I want to be able to do again and again. Well, now think about this for a minute. What if you've made a mistake in that purposeful code? Well, if you have it scattered throughout, just copy pasted. Now, what I mean by copy pasted is like here's an example of that. Okay, so if I went Control C and I just took this out, and I went Control V. Obviously, we can't have it. Um, we gotta go like, oops, wrong way. Okay, and then we would take this out and we would paste it there and move it back. Oh, I guess that that's not right. Yeah, because it's in a for loop. And then take this out and then paste it there. Now, the thing which you have to kind of understand here is that, oh, I'm having trouble here. Okay, what you want to understand is here, so I've copy pasted the code inside the function instead of actually making a function call. Now you say to yourself, ah, oh, wait a minute, actually, I, I don't want that to be high by. I want it to be good by. Oh, okay, well then that means I have to change this. Oh, and where else did I paste it again? Okay, yeah, right, I pasted it here. And, oh yeah, and I pasted it here. Oh, and by the way, I've pasted it in 20 other places. Oh gosh, now I gotta go find all those places because my program's a thousand lines long. You see, so this is stupid. This is n a very poor way of programming because now all those places that you've copy pasted the code, you have to go and edit those all individually. This is not the way to be a good programmer. A good way to do this is if you have to do something repeatedly, is simply to put it in a function. It has a specific purpose. Then you call the function. Then you call the function. Then you call the function. And if you recognize or if you realize that, ah, uh, nope, that's not exactly how I want it to work, no problem. You come up to the function and you change it, and now it's changed everywhere. In other words, you only have to edit it in one location and all function calls to that function are now properly fixed. So you understand the benefit of the, the reason, the justification for creating a function. So let's go on to our next point. Um, what about passing and getting arguments back? So. Let us, uh, let's take a, let's take a um, example here and let's pass something to the function, okay? So in this case, let's get, let's get rid of this here. And we have Z equals hello here. Uh, let's pass, let's pass Z to the function foo. So now that's a string. And so if I do that, I have to, if this isn't gonna work now, because now I'm passing one argument here, and yet my function, which is called foo, 
is not accepting any arguments. So if I try to run this, it's going to fail. And it says, it gives me a little description. It says, foo takes zero arguments, but one was given. So it says, I don't know which function you're trying to call, because the one you're calling doesn't match up with how you're calling it, because this one doesn't have any arguments available to it. So that's fine. I can put an argument in here. Doesn't have to be the same letter, by the way. It doesn't have to be the same variable. I hope I made that clear in the last uh, video. If it is, it's not the same Z. Okay? There's, no, there's nothing special by making it the same letter. It's just the same as if you cha change the variable. So now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to do something very basic with it. And let's just go, let's just print 2 times x. OK. Let's run it. And you see, it prints hello world twice four times. Because multiplying a string by 2, right, is simply doubling the string. Great. But I want to stress that this is not the way I want you to code. This is a bad example. And the reason why it's a bad example is because the function at this point really, I suppose you could suggest, or you, you might have a, a use case for a function to solely print information. However, that's not the usual case. The usual case for a function, let me go to my blackboard and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So the usual case for a function is if this is our function, then the usual case is you want uh, data to go input, like you want input coming in and you want, you want output coming out. Now, perhaps this is not a good word because this maybe sounds like keyboard and screen because these are actually, in the programming world, uh, that's what they kind of refer to. So let's, let's maybe fix this. Uh, let's not call it input. Let's call it uh, maybe data goes in and data comes out. Oops. So these are the data that goes in are your uh, the arguments, the args, and the data that comes out is what you return. Okay? The arguments that go into the function are inside the brackets separated by commas. And the data that comes out comes after the return statement. OK? So if we come back here, this is more typical use of a function. In other words, it processes information somehow, and it sends this processed information back. So instead of actually printing 2 times x, we'll maybe we'll go return now, you don't need brackets on this, although it, it will work if you leave the brackets on. Now, if I run this program, let's see what happens. Nothing. There is no output. Let's think about why. For, it should be pretty obvious at this point. The only way we're going to get the program outputting anything is if we use a print statement. And there's no print statement now. So what we can do is we can print this info here. This is a much better program. And the reason is because the function has a purpose. It's accepting an argument, x, right here. And then it's doing something. It's doing some type of a calculation, or a, it's processing this data somehow, and coming up with a result. And then it's sending the result back. And the way it sends this result back is with the return statement. This is really important. Where does this information go when it sends it back? And the answer is 
right here, foo, bracket, bra bracket, z, bracket, is think of it as being replaced with the value which the function returns. That's what ends up getting printed. Okay? So if we run this, it works. Okay? Now notice we don't necessarily have to print what is returned. We could simply store it. So I could say, for example, uh, I could make a new variable result equals. And now I might decide to process that somehow or do something with it. But just for the example here, I want you to understand that this is another possibility. So the whatever foo returns gets assigned to the result variable and then we can print the result variable. And it's the same. Essentially, it's the same thing. Okay? So this is more of a typical use case for a function. Now, let's discuss a little bit about um, what's called um, local variables. This, is a, this can be a, a tricky subject, especially in Python. And here's why. Most other languages, as far as I'm aware, uh, like for example, things like Java or C, C++, those types of languages, they when you write a function in those languages, then they don't have access to anything other than what is passed to them. So in other words, um, you might say, okay, well, what are we passing to this function? It's x, right? But not this x. I want that to be clear. It's not this x. Where are we passing the information to foo? Let's go look at it on line 11. It's z, OK? So be clear that we have two different scopes here, OK? So if I go back to my uh, thing. So there's two different scopes. Scopes is like a way of saying like um, memory spaces. Okay, so we have our main scope. Think of it. I know this is kind of like a a bit of a for those of you that already might know another language like C C plus uh, plus. I'm using some similar types of vocabulary here, uh, but it serves my purpose. So. Uh, then we have the scope of the function foo. Now, here we do have a variable x. Here we do have a variable y. We do have a variable z. And, and the values are here on lines 7 to 9. But in foo, uh, I have x. And this x and this x are not the same. In fact, this z, right, we all understand this now, this is a string called hello, and that's what gets sent to the x in foo, because that's what we're sending it right here, and that's what's receiving it here. So let's go back to this concept of what can we access inside the function. Well, we can access the variable that we pass it, OK, which is this. But can we access anything else? Question mark. And the answer is yes. And this is a attribute of Python that most other languages don't have. What do I mean by this? Let's take a look. Watch what I can do here. If I come up to the function, now listen. Here's something that I actually forgot to mention. Uh, at this point, the function is over. In other words, control of after the return line, you can't put anything else. So if I, if I put something like this, if I put print, uh, it doesn't matter what I'm putting here. If I run this, 
that print statement never gets executed. Why? Because the return exits the function. The function is over, right? Return exits the function. I want you to put that in your notes. So I don't want you to think, yeah, I can keep, I can keep putting code in my function after a return statement is executed. Now listen, that doesn't, by the way, you could have more than one return. And now you're probably scratching your head and going, how could that possibly be? Well, I could say something like this. If x equals, you know, high, then return something like, uh, you know, uh, three times x. On the other hand, you could say else return. Uh, I could just go like this. There. So now you can see I have two returns, but only one of them is going to ever get executed. And when one of them does get executed, the function is over. This line, the print statement on line 8, will never happen. OK? Especially in this type of a situation where we have an else. Because if this is false, then this is always going to be executed and the function's finished. So now that we understand that, let's change this a little bit. And let's perhaps, oops, let's put this code at the, at the top. Now, here's another way that this function could be executed. Um, if we could say elif, or sorry, is another way this function could end. I could say if x equals by, then do this. Now here's the question. What if it's not high and it's not by? Then what gets returned? Well, the answer is it doesn't return anything. It gets to line 9, and there's, there's nothing else. The, the function's finished. So we're not going to return. The function's not going to return anything. If, if x is not high or by, but the function will end because there's nothing else to do. So, l for example, let me just, in this case, let me run this. Notice z is hello, so it's neither high nor by. So if I run this, f5, it's going to, it's going to, um, so this is really interesting. Okay, I'm so happy this happened. Really, really, really awesome situation. What the heck is none? Wait a minute, I get where this is coming from. We're in this loop here. Let me pull this over a little bit so we can see the code. So I'm, I'm doing this loop four times, okay? And in the loop, I'm calling foo four times. Great. So let's come up to this function and let's do it. We print out the A's, done. And then is X high? No, it's, it's hello. Is it by? No, it's hello. So it doesn't do either of these returns. It gets to line 9 and says, I'm done. And guess what it returns? Nothing. Because there is no re there's n there's no return here anymore. But guess what? This function, whatever it re it, whatever it gets, is being assigned to result. And here's the cool thing about this, is that nothing in Python is something. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but nothing is represented by the none object. And so none is a Python object that represents nothing. Take some time to digest that sentence. You can <laughs> repeat this, that sentence. But 
that, that this is a super awesome example because now you recognize that it, it actually is still returning something, but it's the none object. Okay? You can actually test for that too. I want you to take note though that the, the none in Python is, is a special word and it starts with a capital N. Okay? So that's, that's a special keyword in Python. Um, now, what was I going to do with this example? Oh, now I remember. Okay, so, yeah. Now, instead of printing AAA here, let's print something else. This, this I'm, I'm kind of, a, I was getting to this, I mentioned it earlier. But uh, what else could we print here, or what else do we have access to, other than what we're passing to the function? And the answer is uh, pretty much everything that's in the main code here. So in other words, any, this is the main code. Anything, any variables or any objects that we've created here, we have access to it in the function. And this is super unusual. You can't do this in other languages. So I'm, I'm in some ways, I'm a little bit scared to teach this to you. So what do I mean by that? OK, so let's try it. Watch this. Let's print y. Do you think that's going to work? Wait, we're not passing that data to the function, so how could it access it? Let's try it. <gasps> it works. It's printing the 2. Wait, how does it know that y is 2? I thought you said I thought you said that these scopes were separate. They are. But the way that Python searches for variables is first it looks to see if there is a local copy and there isn't there's no how do we know there is no local copy do you want me to tell you how we know watch this i'm gonna mess this up ready i'm gonna say y equals 999 right there that's bef that comes after by the way that when i'm trying to print it so now you're going, hmm, I wonder, is it going to go get this too? So let's go back and let's go over the, the order of searching. OK, so uh, wrong tablet. Let's go back to our, right? So let's go uh, order for searching. Uh, variables. So f number one, it looks for a local variable. Okay, that's number one. Number two, it goes and looks for. Uh, now you could consider this to be. You, some people call this uh, a main scope, but I think um, Python. Uh, might actually say that it's more like a global one. I think that's the word they use. And so in this case, uh, and then after that, of course, uh, I think it might actually do imported ones, but also it depends on how you import stuff. Uh, we'll talk about how you import stuff later. There's a good way to import stuff and a bad way to import stuff. But I'm not going to teach that right now. So for right now, let's just forget about this one. Um, and let's just concentrate on these two. Okay, so we've got local and global variables. So uh, th this here, this y, is you can consider it to be a global variable. Okay, in other words, it's not inside another function. That's the main part of our program. But remember what I said, when you, when Python looks for a variable, the first place it looks is the local variable. So it goes through this function and says, is there a line that says, is there a line that says y is equal to? That's what it's looking for. And guess what? It finds it on line 9. 
So that means a local variable for y exists. A local y exists. Now there's a problem. The problem is you're trying to print the value of y, that local variable, before you've assigned it. Watch what happens when I run this. It exact look at the look at the look at the words it's using. It's so descriptive. It says local variable y referenced before assignment. Holy smokes. It's talking to us as if it was a person. That's fantastic. So if I now, OK, so this is going to fail, right? But if I remove this, if I take it out completely and I run this now, it works. And why does it work? Because as I said before, it, it searches for things in this order, first for local variables, then for global variables. So let's ask ourselves something. Is there a local version of y? The answer is no. Why not? Because there's no y equals anything in this function. So therefore, it says, all right, let's go to search number two. Is there a global y? And guess what? It finds it on line 13. And that's the value that it uses, the 2. So that's how Python's uh, searching for variables works. This, I got to specify this. I got to really like, dun, 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 look into the camera. This is very unusual as programming languages go. Most programming languages, line 4 will not I repeat, will not work. OK? The only things the functions have access to is what they are passed. And in this case, the only thing we're passing is hello, the value passed from the z variable here. But Python is m more flexible than that. It can access variables outside of the function as long as they're not locally defined. Now, if there was locally defined, look what happens. I showed you the example where it fails, right? But obviously, if I did this, if I said y equals 999 here, and I run this, now look what happens. Now, it doesn't go and get the global one. It gets the local one because the, f number, because the first thing it searches is the local variable and to do ta-da it exists and it is assigned before referencing it in the next line so therefore it, it we can't access this to anymore okay what's also interesting to note here is that there's a there's some there's some important aspect to consider here regarding mutability. In other words, um, c can we, if you, th if you think about this now, right, um, because now you're thinking, hmm, can we change something in the function that we uh, that we have in the global or in the main scope here. Can we change something in the function? So let's think about this for a second. Uh, can we change y? How would we change y? And what kind of data is y? It's an integer, right? Well, guess what? Here, let me. Let me just make a little table for you, OK? Uh, let's clear all this stuff. And so mutable and immutable, OK? Immutable is an integer. 
we can't change it. A string is also immutable. We cannot change it. A float is also immutable. We can't change it. A boolean is also immutable. We can't change it. So what do I mean by you can't change it? You have to recreate it in order to change it. So if you say x equals 1, if you want to change if you want to change it to a 2, the only way you can change it is if you say x equals 2. Have you changed x? No, you haven't. What you've done is you've recreated another object and assigned it to to the variable 2. So in other words, the only way to change if you want to call it change we're not changing it it's to recreate it so this assignment creates a variable so therefore if we I mean what's the only other type of uh, data that we've been dealing with and we've just kind of touched upon it but not fully we'll do it more later in the course but the only thing so far that we can change is a list so remember what a list looks like. It's got the square brackets, and you've got things inside separated with commas. It could be anything inside. doesn't matter what's, what's in between the commas. And you can have as many things in the list as you like. Uh, but this is the only thing that's changeable. The things You can change the things inside here, and that's mutable. So let's think about this for a second. Why is this important? Well, let's go back here. Let's try and change some things. Can we change x? Well, let's just, let's get, let's kind of clean up this code a little bit so that it's maybe just looking a little bit uh, better. Well, let, let's just try, let's just go with y again. And in fact, let's, Let's forget about doing things so many times, and let's just call foo once, and let's let's pass it uh, let's pass it y. There we go. All right, and just so that we're not going to get confused with the x's and the y's, uh, we'll even say this is y. Okay, and we'll say y equals nine nine nine. We'll print the y. Great. Yes, we've changed y. And let's print it here. Print y. And when we run this, it's not changed. It's not changed. Can you see that? We printed here, we printed 999. And here, we printed 2. So we can't change the y. So what are we changing? Well, you're simple, and this is this this kind of like reinforces my point. If I change this to a different variable name, it doesn't change anything. It's still a different y. Okay. So if I run this again, it's exactly the same. I just made the variable y to try and trick your brain into thinking, oh yeah, we've changed y. Well, no, we haven't. Why not? What type of variable is y? It's an integer. Are integers mutable? No. Oh. So, look what we've done here on line four. We've tried to change. So if I, if I do this again, we've tried to change an integer, but we're not. On line four, what we're doing is we are now creating. Why are we creating a local variable? Created a local variable called y. How, why do we do that? Because we have the, the code y equals. You see how that works? We have the code, as soon as you have the code y equals something, then you've got a local variable. 
So in essence, you can't change anything that's immutable in the function. Well, then how could we change it? Well, you could change it like this. Ready? Watch. Instead of printing y, you could go like this. You could go return y. And now, look what you could do. When you call it, you could say, instead of just calling it now, because this in the, the, the return value is not being assigned to anything on line, after, sorry, on line 5, we're returning y, so we're returning 999. But here on line 13, we're not actually assigning that return value to anything. It's just sitting there on line 13, and that information is not going anywhere. So let's assign it to something. Watch what I'm going to assign it to. I'm now going to assign it to y. So I'm passing y itself to the function. Now, l let me just say here, uh, we don't actually have to, let's, um, instead of saying, because uh, this is kind of weird, because we don't actually need to pass anything here. So we could say, for example, um, yeah, let's just leave it like that. Let's just leave it like that. Okay, um, because what I mean by that is if I change this to, if I, I mean, I'm, I'm changing something, right? But I don't have to say y equals. I could just simply just go return 999. And that'll work too, but it, it's a moot point. Still not changing y here, but now that I'm returning that local variable, it gets assigned to whatever the function returns, and it's going to return 999. So if I now run it, I get 999. But let me just, just so that you understand what's happening here, I'll print y here. I'll return y, and then I'm going to print y here again. And this is not going to be 222 anymore. It's going to be 999. So the answer to the question, how do you change something? Well. You can't change an integer. I'm reassigning it here on line 14. It's, it's the same as if I did this. You see? So I have y equals 2 here. Then I have y equals 9. That's is exactly the same kind of code. Now, um, what about the situation where you can change something? It's the same thing with strings to anything that's immutable. So let's discuss something that we can change. Watch this. If I have L equals a list, and I have A, B, C, OK? Now I'm going to call uh, foo. And I'm going to pass it L. Okay. Now, in this case, L is mutable. Okay. Um, and I don't have to call this L. I could call it uh, anything I want. Let's call it A, for example. Doesn't matter. But if I now say a 0 equals high, now after I call the function, let's print out the list. Ready? Let's see if it's changed. It is changed. Notice it says high BC. That's the list there. So now you go, oh, why is that? Because here's the reason. We didn't actually do, we didn't actually go A equals. We said A zero equals. So we're not actually reassigning A, we're modifying A. Why? Because A is modifiable, because lists are mutable. 
So by the way, we didn't even have to pass the argument here because there it's a local variable because we've passed it. But even I could do this. So now it'll go to rule number two. Remember the, remember the rules for searching? Uh, they were, well, I think I may have erased them. Whoops. Yeah, I've erased them. Uh, they were, remember rule number two was it searches uh, globally. So in this case, I'll pass nothing to the function. So I have to get rid of anything in here. And then I'm going to be changing L. It, there is no local L because there's nothing that says L equals inside the function. And so when I call it, let's see what happens. It still works. So this is rule number two. It doesn't find a local copy of the of the list. It goes gets the global one, modifies it, and even the, the one in the main program is now changed. OK? Now, let's say you didn't want to change it. What would you do? Well, you could end up, for example, taking a full slice of it. That might be one alternative. You could say, for example, A equals L full slice. You have to take a full slice. And so now, if I modify A, L will still remain intact, A, B, C. OK? So I'll give you uh, an assignment now. OK, so let's actually give you guys an assignment. Right here staring at you was the uh, shuffle assignment we did last time. Uh, I want you to turn this into a function. So simply have that first line in the main part of the program, and then call the function and call the function, the name of the function, call it shuffle. And have the function return the shuffled word. And then once that, once that shuffled word is returned, then print it out outside of the function. So there should be no print statement inside of the function. Pause the video now and give it a shot. All right, here's the solution. So look how easy this is. Look how easy this is. All I got to do is take this code up here, cut it. Oops. There we go. Put it down here. Take this print out. And we will now take all this code, select it all, and hit tab. So we move it in. Let's make a function here, def shuffle. And let's, um, let's send it the variable w, OK? Because we're actually working with w here, right? And now let's go, let's, let's call this, we don't need to call this w, we can call it word. And now, but before we finish this, there's one thing we haven't done here. And we need to return uh, shuff. OK? Because we, we set shuff to nothing here. But when the loop is finished, it's done. Let's return the value. Now let's go. We grab the word. And now we can just go print shuff, shuffle, and let's send it word. And that's it. Ready? Let's run it. Enter word. Canada. I can add. Yay. See, so notice now my program just turns into two lines. And uh, everything is in my, every, the whole, all the code is, is in my uh, function. Okay. 
Um, so what I'd like you to do, now, another little kind of mini assignment is um, have a function. So let's make a new thing here. Let's make a new function called alphabet. And let's have it accept two um, characters. Let's just call it A and B. And then what I want you to do is, for example, print alphabet and let's send A to A and let's send Z to B and what I want is I want a string that has everything from A to Z. So pause the video now and give it a shot. Okay. And we're back. So the solution to this one is basically we're going to use the same kind of a loop that we did before. We'll say, first of all, we need an empty string, right? We'll say uh, alpha equals nothing. And then we'll say for x in range, and we'll say ordinal A comma ordinal B plus 1 and then we'll go into here and instead of saying we're not going to print anything in here we're just going to say alpha equals alpha plus chr x and now when the uh, loop is done, we'll just say return alpha. And so if we, if we run this, we got to save it. So we'll save it here. Let's call this uh, alphabet um, call it alphabets or something dot py. And so now when we run it, we get A to Z. And the cool thing here is, listen, if I change this, I could change it from like something like, you know, K to Z. And if I run it again, it, it's only going to give me K to Z. If I change this K to R, let's run it again. Then it just gives me K to R. I got to be careful, though, because I can't, I can't um, you know, have a, a bigger letter here. I can't go like from R to K. It'll fail. But, um, but that's the gist of it. All right? So, all right, so uh, I also want to show you that there is the ability for a function to call another function. So, if, for example, I went something like, if I made a function called add, and I did something like this. Now let's uh, let's actually let's actually save this as um, let's save it in functions, and let's save it uh, func func. Okay. And let's say return x plus y. Great. Now let's go def difference. And let's go x comma y again. And now let's go return x minus y. Now watch what I can do. I can go print add. Now look what I'm going to send the two things for add. 
I'm going to go diff. And I'll say uh, 9, comma, 3, comma, diff. Um, something like 6, comma, 2. So maybe that was too many spaces. It doesn't really matter, but just to make it look nice. So now do you understand here what, what I'm doing? I want you to pause the video right now and predict what the answer, what the solution is when I run this. Pause it. Okay, let's try it. Here we go. Let's run it. Boom. Uh-oh. I've got a problem. It says line 11. What did I what did I forget? Okay. Hmm. Well, guess what? I didn't close off enough brackets here. Got to close off that one too. Now let's run it. And the answer is 10. Why is the answer 10? Well, if we go to our whiteboard, okay, let's clear this. So, um, what we're doing is inside, we're taking the difference of 9 minus 3, that's 6. We're also taking the difference of 6 minus 2, that's 4. Then we're adding those two, and that's going to give us 10. So you notice how we're actually calling a function, and this is, this, this is returning a value, this is returning a value, and then we're sending those two values that they're returned to another function to add those two values. Notice it also, it's also a good idea to name your function something descriptive because it's easier to understand, okay? All right, last assignment for today. Write a function called palindrome. It should accept a word and it should return a boolean. Okay? In other words, if the word is a palindrome, it should return true. If the word is not a palindrome, it should return false. Write this function. And you can do it an easy way if you like. All right, so pause the video. OK, and we're back. So here is the solution to palindrome. Let's put the function up here. Let's go def palindrome. Let's send it a word. And now let's return if word equals word negative one. That's a pretty short function, but it works because the equal sign is going to return true or false. So if we go print palindrome uh, something like race car and we run this it returns true okay uh, and if, of course if we modify it and we run it again it's gonna return false so that's the lesson for today I uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, we'll see you next time. This was a long one. Thanks for hanging in there.